So what I'd like to do now is to introduce uh, David, David Grigg. So thanks to Dave Perigo for, for introducing us and suggesting that, uh, that, that we invite uh, D David on. Um, We've had we've had a quick quick chat, and I and I and I, I know we're we're going to love love this story and and um, hear all sorts of uh, challenges that 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 they have to have overcome in this uh, in wanting to do this arch to arc event. So, David, did you want to share your? Would you rather share your screen or have, yeah, it's probably better isn't yeah, it? I can if, do you, yeah. if you bring it no up problem. yourself. Um, save you save you saying next slide and all of those things. So. If you'd like to do that, and then uh, and then over to you. Cool. Brilliant. Okay. What's my mouse? There you are. That's come through. Just lost my mouse. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, all good. Pretty good. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I know uh, there's some, some friendly faces. I know, I know some of you, and I don't know others. Um, so uh, apologies for those. I may have already bored before with this story. Um, hopefully, you'll take something valuable away from it. So um, Dave Perigo, I know, has heard this before. I've, I've known Dave for, for a number of years now, and um, Dave's heard this story before, and he kind of kindly passed me on to, to Kevin. Kevin was looking for somebody to, to, do, to do a talk. So happy to do it, and hopefully... I'm just going to talk through the story and reminisce on what we did and how we got there. Um, explain what, what the challenge was and some of the challenges we've had along the way. Um, but hopefully you just take one thing away that maybe you can help with your personal life, business life, whatever. I'm not going to try and extract um, things from it to kind of force ideals onto you, but just trying to share the story and hopefully you can come away some, with some ideas and maybe fit into what you do. Um, I know for me personally, when we did this event, um, I took so much from it and so many, so much learning experience from it that I drag into my own personal life, my life as a parent, my life as a business owner, all those kind of things where I use those lessons that I learned from this particular experience in my life. Um, and hopefully you can, you can drag one of those things out. So thanks for taking time every day and thanks for listening to me. Um, Kevin's kind of given me half an hour remit to, to speak. Um, I could probably talk about this all day if I'm honest, because it's, it's, it's quite, you know, I, it's quite nice to shoehorn it into a bragging conversation, but um, I can talk about it as long as I like. I noticed you've all done the etiquette thing where you've, um, you've, you've, you've you put yourself on mute, but please feel free to take yourself off on mute and give me some heckling. It's going to be fairly difficult to talk to a screen for half an hour. Um, so feel free. I know Jenny's smiling. She's probably looking forward to giving me some abuse. So uh, feel free to jump in whenever you wish. Um, <clears throat> I know there's some, there's some time for questions at the end, but if you think there's a question you can jump in and you want to have a conversation about, then I'm happy to do that. Keep it interactive. Um, so who am I? Um, so my name is Dave Grigg, um, and where did the Arch to Arc come from? So just before the Arch to Arc, I grew up um, enjoying sport, enjoying running. I ran England schoolboys, I ran regional cross country championships, etc. And I loved running, I, enjoy, I enjoyed running, it was my thing. Got to around 16, 17, um, discovered beer and women, and stopped doing that a little bit. So uh, yeah, it kind of went by the wayside for a little bit. But then uh, in my early 20s, I started racing triathlon. Um, and doing the, the short distances to start with, so swim, bike, and run, uh, and eventually working up to uh, Ironman distance. So Ironman distance of triathlon is is a 2.4-mile 2, 2 swim, 112-mile bike ride, uh, and then a marathon. So it's a full-day triathlon is a long-distance event, and I started doing those kind of things. Whilst I was training for that, um, like-minded people tend to attract. So I, I met a guy while I was training, and we were looking to do a charity event um, whilst we were, we were doing that and raise some money for charity. And also at the, at the time, it was not only doing that charity event, but to raise money for charity now, you've kind of got to do something out of the norm. So we researched and we came across the Arch to Arc, um, which I'll come on to, I'll come on to the details in a, in, a, in a moment about the actual event. But the Arch to Arc, essentially, what, the other thing we saw, we saw um, was there was a record available. And the current record when we first started out doing it was, 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 was owned by, by a team by British Gas was sponsored by British Gas and it was 67 hours. And we kind of did the calculations that we could smash that record. So we set everything out up to, to kind of say, right, we're going to go for that record and try and achieve the record to get from London to Paris in the quickest time. Um, so that's where we got to. Um, so what, what I've already mentioned about the takeaway today, what I hope you'll get today is just one thing that you could kind of, that resonates with you. I know I always go to these kind of, um, 
when you need to hey, listen to these business talk, often what happens is it just reminds you of things you already knew, but you're not you're not doing. And I get that all the time. So hopefully, maybe it reaffirms this something you've already knew, but you're not doing. Maybe you can kind of drive it into into your habits and in, 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 in your daily occurrences, um, and get one underlying message. Just one of the things that ran through our planning for the Arch to Arc was the right environment. And this actually happened after the Arch to Arc, but it, it really resonates with me. And it's about the right environment. And one of the biggest things we had within the team was the right environment. Um, I was fortunate enough a few years ago to go to a, a leadership and management course at Loughborough University. And if you get a chance, Google this guy, because he's, he's an absolute legend. Um, he's a guy called Ian Arminger. Um, and He's basically been the British swimming coach for the last 20 plus years. He's had numerous Commonwealth, Commonwealth titles, numerous British champions, Olympic champions. He's coached Adam Peaty. Um, he's, he's a kind of guy. And his mantra about the right environment was second to none. And it's really kind of what he'd get across when I went on his course. He would turn up at the pool at half four every single morning ready to get everything ready for when his athletes turned up at half five so they saw his image there they saw his habit they saw what he was doing okay the fine minutia he put into place for that environment was the temperature of the pool they researched the pet temperature of the pool they researched the p the ph level the chemical ph level of the pool for the best catch in the water so they can get the best times they'd even research the baffles in the middle of the water they'd research the the baffles at the side of the water so to keep the water as flat as possible instead of the waves building up. So when they're swimming, the waves don't interrupt the swimmer and get the maximum speed out of the pool. They also, the environment, the lighting, the heating temperature outside the pool, and also the music that the athletes used to come into in certain training sessions to motivate them to do different things. Um, the right environment, he drilled that down to, to, to a kind of an, an art form. And I think it's really important with, with anything you're trying to achieve is making sure you're in that right environment. You've got the right things around you to breed success in whatever you're looking to do. Um, and I, I really that message really resonated with me um, and I thought it was fantastic. And how can we kind of relate that back into our businesses and into our life, I think is a, is a massive lesson. One of the key, well, two key mantras we had within the Arch to Arc when we were doing the, the, the thinking and the, and the planning was just asking ourselves two key questions. And the two key questions were, does it take the thinking out of it? We knew when we're doing the event, we're gonna be tired. So does it stop us having to make that decision when we're tired? Can we make that decision now and pre-plan for it? And also, does it make us get does it make us get there quicker? So if it doesn't, if it didn't do those two things, it went on the back burner. But if it did those two things, we it went into the mix and we, we we discussed it to try and make sure that we we took the thinking out and that we got there faster. And that was the two things to keep. So that was the whole premise of how what the environment we were going to create was. Um. So the Arch to Arc, to give you an overview on the Arch to Arc, what is the Arch to Arc? Um, it's, it's a non-stop triathlon from London to Paris in, in more detail. So we, as a relay, it was a, it was a one, hour, one hour rotation, non-stop. So we started at Marble Arch um, and we had an 87 mile run from Marble Arch to Dover. We then had a, a channel swim crossing, 25, 25 miles at the shortest point, um, and then 187 mile cycle to Paris. And everything that we did within the within the environment, everything we did with regards to the challenge, had to revolve around the tide times with the channel. We could only go at certain times within the tide times, and also how how how, how the conditions in the, in the channel were. So, another kind of mantra that we had was: when you're mapping out your goals, we often go got goals. Where are we trying to get to? Mapping out the goals from B to A. So, where are we trying to get to in the end? Um, and, and and so that we can work back to make sure we achieve that. So we knew we had to get into the sea at a certain point. So we had to work back our start time at Marble Arch to make sure that when we kind of calculated our running times, we could get there at the right point to get the best sea conditions to then get across the sea as quickly as possible to then get onto our bikes. Um, so fairly simple really when you think about it. <laughs> um, any questions so far? I'm mindful I'm talking at a screen, it's really strange. That's phenomenal. I think that's that's some really good good lessons already, Dave. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Just feel, feel, honestly, feel free to shout out. Um, I will I will proceed. Um, mentioned about the right environment, um, and we all we also know about the, the right people. So 
the right people in your team, but not only the right people in your team, but the right people in the right place. So, because sometimes we've got the right people in our team, but are they in the right place? How do we know they're in the right place? How do we know that person's the right for that, fit for that job? Or have they just kind of fallen into that job because nobody else wanted to do it or because we, they've kind of put their hand up? Making sure we monitor who's in the right place. And I'm going to come on to that in a second. Um, Kevin, could you keep me up to date with time as well? Because I haven't started a clock or anything, so I might kind of babble on and stuff. So just cut me short if you need to. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're fine for the moment. Yep. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, so have you got the talent positioned in the right place? And do you know the talents of your team? Um, and who's best at what, what scenario? So, for example, just to kind of introduce you all, that's me on the left there. That's, uh, that's me there with, with my eyes closed, obviously scared about something. Um, next to me is Tom. Tom is a, was a national level swimmer. Um, so Tom is a phenomenal swimmer. We've got next to him with Nick. Nick, and again, we did some massive amounts of planning. Nick was actually our reserve, just in case one of the guys got injured. Um, so Nick was our seventh team member. Uh, didn't actually compete, but he was a massive support to the crew. Then we've got Stu in the middle. Stu's a cyclist, so Stu's strong in, in, in his cycling form. Um, Ed there, um, next to him with the, with the short hair or no hair, um, is a phenomenal swimmer. Uh, he was the quickest out of a lot of us in terms of, in terms of swimming. Then we've got Big Rob. Uh, Big Rob with a hairy back and nicknamed Chewbacca. He's, he's a triathlete, uh, similar to me, so we're both triathletes, so all round, all round um, uh, fitness guys. And he's obviously a big lad. Six foot four, Rob. And then we've got Luke. And Luke's also an elite level swimmer. Uh, so we had three really good swimmers in the team. We had a good cyclist and we had two triathletes for all round skill sets. Um, so the event took us, you know, from London to Paris, but the event actually started 18 months before we started the event. We had 18 months of planning um, and we had lots of things to put in place. So we wanted to create press coverage. We wanted to create... Um, money for charity. So we, we, we had a goal of raising 15K for, for charity. So we wanted to get some press coverage for that. We ended up with a, an appearance on Midlands today, which was which was great. Gave us some really good coverage. They did a, they did a piece on Midlands today for us. Uh, we did some marketing. So talking about what Doug was talking about earlier, we had to get ourselves out there, try and get people to support us, try and uh, snaffle some free kit, uh, try and snaffle a free minibus and, and get some donations to get us across the start line. It cost us five grand just to get on the start line for support crew, nutrition, kit, uh, channel swim, uh, the, 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 the boat, the pilot boat that we needed and all those kind of things. Um, so there's lots of logistics going on in the background, making sure that we got everything prepped out. And we did, we, we planned contingency plans for everything as well. Uh, and we put everything in place. What could possibly go wrong? If it does, what are we going to do? Um, we wanted to take the thinking out before we started the event so that we didn't have to think when we were tired. That was the main, the main key. Um, and then that created momentum. It got us over those, those challenges. We allocate the tasks to everybody and it meant that we overcame those things that maybe would have stopped us in our tracks, you know, and it maybe created a bit of inertia to stop us actually thinking maybe we can't do this. We, we, we had everyone on account, everyone had a piece, everyone had a, a section they were accountable for um, and because they were accountable for it and because you're part of a team, you feel responsible that you've got to do your part and you don't want to let everybody else down. So that was massive within the team. We had a great team spirit, constant meetings, um, you know, and, and, and making sure that everyone knew what their role was um, and everyone wanted to kind of pull together for the team, not only in the training element. Um, so there's lots of planning going on. Um, one of the key challenges... Uh, and one of the things I really want to kind of share with you is a, a personal challenge for me, really. So to do what the challenge, we all had to qualify to swim the English Channel. You had to prove that you could swim nonstop for two hours in temperatures below 15 degrees. Um, now, I'm, I'm, I'm a skinny lad. I'm, I'm a little bit heavier than I was then, but I'm a skinny lad. I was, you know, low percentage body fat and I don't really do cold too well. Um, I'm, I'm not really a big fan of the cold. Um, so, but what we had to do in the, in, the, in the March before the June was go and do a two hour qualification swim in Bournemouth. Um, and this was kind of a really poignant point for me. We, I put everything together with, with Stu, put the team together, put all this work into place. We're now going down to qualify in Bournemouth for the swim. And we got down to Bournemouth and the temperature in Bournemouth in, of the sea at that time was in, in March was eight degrees. So if you imagine your local swimming pool is probably around 24, 25 degrees, you can kind of imagine what kind of eight degrees feels like. It's not, it's not very pretty. Um, 
we went down there in the morning, jumped into the water or, or walked in tentatively like a, a monkey getting into a hot bath. He was kind of, you know, a bit shaky and trying to, trying to uh, avoid the cold. And the water was freezing cold. It was literally like putting your face into an icebox. It was, it was horrible. Um, I got in with a wetsuit. And the, the idea with a wetsuit is the wetsuit allows water in. The water then fills the wetsuit and your body apparently warms that water up and gives you a layer of, you know, heat between you and the wetsuit. Um, not sure that my wetsuit was working on the day. So we got into the water for the, for the first hour. We were allowed to get out after an hour um, for to, to get a drink. Um, and I kind of, when I got into the water, my kind of first goal in my head was, I just need to get this first hour out of the way. I was slowing down, my lips were blue. Um, and it was, it was, we were getting to a point where it was really, really cold in that water. And I naively thought, if I, get, if I can just get to the hour, I can get a drink, I can warm up for, for a couple of minutes and then I can get back in the water and do my second hour, no problem. Um, I, I got through that first hour. I got out of the water to come and get a drink. Um, and again, the, the guys were saying, oh, your lips are blue, you're kind of really struggling. Um, I knew I had to get back in so I couldn't let the team down. Um, I naively thought in those two minutes that I would warm up. Didn't really happen. Um, but I, I went back towards the water to get back in the water um, and just trying to crack on with what I was doing. I lasted about another five or six minutes before I literally couldn't, couldn't, couldn't carry on swimming. Um, and I failed the qualification swim. Um, I had to pull myself out of the water. I, I came out of the water, couldn't really talk because it was too cold. Couldn't take the lid off my, off my bottle because it was too cold. And ended up going and getting, getting in the support van, uh, turning the heaters on and staying in there for a couple of hours to try and warm up. In that moment, in those, that time when I was there, I, I, I knew I'd let the team down. I couldn't, if, if I couldn't qualify, I couldn't swim. I couldn't be part of the event. And that's all that was running around my head. Um, fortunate enough to me, um, 10 minutes after I failed, Big Hairy Rob also failed. So I had an accomplice uh, who'd, who'd failed as well. And it, again, it sounds, hard, hard, no, it sounds bad now, but it actually relieved me a little bit because the pressure was off me as the individual who failed the swim. The other four guys went on, went on to qualify. The other, the other four guys stayed in for the two hours. They went on to qualify and they came out and they were, they were freezing cold. Um, and they absolutely hammered me and Rob with banter for about the next... 10 days and um, me and Rob had to pull ourselves together, sort ourselves out and do it again. Um, and cut a long story short, we went and did it again. Um, I didn't get out of the water the second time. I just stuck it, stayed in the water, carried on um, and, and did the two hours swim just to make sure we, I could be on the start line. Um, thoughts that were going through my mind at that point were, if I can't do it, what am I going to do? I can't, I can't be part of the event. Am I going to be part of this support crew? Would my ego let me be part of the support crew if I can't do the swim. And, um, you know, I, so I was, in a, I was in a rough place, but it's overcoming that fear of failure and having the, the why, the big enough why to drive you back in to go, do you know what? I'm going to go and do it. I really want to do this. This is what I set out to do. I'm not going to have it, have it beat me. What do I need to do to get over that point? Um, and having a big enough reason to go and do it. Um, yeah, I could go on about that for, for a long time. It was a real, real big poignant point for me. Um, how are we doing for time, Kevin? Got 15 minutes if you need it. Okay, perfect. That's great stuff. <clears throat> right. Um, so the other good benefit we had was um, because um, both Luke and Ed were Birmingham University old boys and part of Birmingham University, we got offered the chance to, for them to do some sports testing for us. So they put a training program together for us where they measured us first, lactate threshold training, uh, and put a training package together for us so we can maximise who was best at what and what positions we should go in in terms of the event. Um, now, these things you can see there, so that's Rob there on the treadmill, and you can see he's tied to a harness above him, um, and behind there, there's a bike, which uh, I think that's Tom on the bike there. And basically what we were doing was lactate threshold testing. So basically you go on, you go on the bike or the runner and they slowly increase the speed or the resistance and every minute they just they inject they take some blood from your from your finger and they measure the lactate in your butt in your body to work to realize how hard your body's working at a certain point your body will basically say you know it's got too much lactate in it and it will just kind of fold down your butt and your muscles will stop working you get lactate lactate above lactate threshold the harness that robs in there is basically you're going to going to push you so hard that you're going to fail and the the harness is there to catch you because you're running so fast and you run out of gas. 
Um, and that's how hard we're pushing. So we're pushing us to the point where, you know, you're going to get that sick feeling in your lungs and you, you've got to that point. So you're really pushing your body. Um, and it was great. You know, it, it was a great thing to do to, to push yourself to failure, know where your limits are, know what you can, what you can do. And then also train yourself to get better. They put the plan together to actually say, this is what you need to do to get better. How can I get to the next level? And that's what we did. We did this nine months out. So we had a nine month training plan to get us all up to level, all, all up to fitness. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, it was, you know, an enjoyable thing to do and push ourselves, push ourselves to the limit. Um, from that, it gave us the positions where we needed to be. It gave us the strongest runners. So it gave, we already knew the strongest swimmers. Um, it gave us the strongest um, runners and it gave us the strongest cyclists in terms of what we could push out, the numbers we could push out. So we positioned ourselves accordingly. We monitored the map of where we were going and we gave the runners the flattest sections so they could open their legs up and get us quick, get us there quicker. We gave the cyclists the flatter cycling sections so they could open the, open their legs up and they could put, put full gas down to make sure we get there as quickly as possible. And we'd already positioned the, the, the swimmers based on their based on their level of you know level of, of swimmability. Um, so three sections in, in the in the run. So um, we started from Marble Arch and we the, in, in, when we were coming out of coming out of London um, we. We positioned the weaker runners first, a couple of the weaker runners first, because they're running through the city. They can't open their legs up. So we, they, we left Marble Arch at five o'clock on the evening. Um, and I, I, was the, I was the best runner in the group. Running is my thing and it always has been. So I got positioned uh, number four in the run. And so we'd already, already been out and about for three hours. I'm on the road running. Um, and my kind of ego, when I first got onto the, onto the, onto the run, I'd have been waiting three hours like a wasp in a tic-tac box in that minibus waiting to go for three hours. When By the time we got to the point where I was on the road, I was, I was pretty excited to get going and do my bit for the team. Um, I knew that I could, if, if I could run six minute mile pace, I could do 10 miles in, in, my, hour, in my hour slot. And that's what I was aiming for, having my Garmin runner on it, et cetera. Um, when I went, I came off the minibus and I did the tag with, uh, with, with Luke. Luke tagged me in and I went running. And within the first 800 meters, I'd run out of breath. I'd, I, 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 was, I was gassed. I was like, what's going on here? It's because I've been sat in a minibus and I'm cooped up. Why am I out of breath? I've only been running for literally a couple of minutes. What's, what's going wrong? And I've carried on anyway because the, the minibus is, is, is scooting by us and doing a leapfrog past me to kind of keep the support going. Um, and I'm still out of breath and I'm, I'm wondering what's going on. And after the first minute, sorry, after the first mile, my Garmin beats, and I looked down and I'd done the first mile in five minutes and seven seconds. I'd, I'd gone far too quickly. I'd got far too excited wanting to do my bit and I'd gone way ahead of pace. And this is about taking the thinking out of it. So straight away, I've looked at the watch. I'm going too fast. I need to slow down. I'm, 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 I'm getting too excited. These are the things that we were doing to make sure we, 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 we took the thinking out what we were doing. Okay, so then I just calmed down, settled into my pace. And, and, and knocked out my members. Um, so you, I wanted to do the best for the team, but also I need to work within my limits. I need to work within what I'm doing. Because um, if I don't, I'm no good to anyone. I, I'm, no, I'm no good if I gas myself and I'm, I can't do my second run slot and then I can't do the swim and I can't do the bike. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to be in the right position to do the right things for my team. Um, so it's knowing those things. Um, it's, it's keeping hold of your, uh, the monkey inside you that wants to get out and, and rip the road up, which, which is what happened. Um, the run, the run was, was, was went well. We did, we did okay, and the run it was fantastic. Halfway through the run, we knew that we might not be able to get to run, do the channel because the weather conditions were too bad. We were being told that we might not be able to do this, this, this uh, the swim at all because the swelling in the, in the in the sea was too big, and we might end up voiding the challenge. Um, so we were kind of nervous about that anyway. But we carried on with the run, and we did really well, really well with the run, and we did the run in, in under eleven hours. Um, and we got to we got to the uh, we got to to Dover in the early hours of the morning in the darkness. Um, still 50-50 whether we we're going to be able to do the channel or not. Um, and we did it. Obviously, we did. Uh, we were allowed to get into the channel, and we we're allowed to go and do that thing. Um, what I should also say is when we mentioned when I talked about the uh, the record, when we first set out to do it, the record was sixty seven hours. And we'd done our maths and we knew we were going to smash 67 hours. We, we kind of, as long as everything went well, we were going to smash that record. Three weeks before we set out, 
having told everyone we're going to do a record and all the marketing material going around a record, another team went out from British Military Fitness uh, and they did it in 39 hours. Uh, and they dropped the record down by a big, big chunk. So we were like, we'd kind of gauge for like 44, 40, 43, 44. And they just, they just kind of ruined our, our, all our, our whole marketing plan, basically. Um, but we're obviously still going for it. And then we had this trouble with, with, the, with the channel swim where the, the weather was going to be terrible. Um, but we're just, we're just cracking on. We're doing what we're doing. Controlling the controllables, doing what we do, and just carry on and be as best as we can, you know. Um, but we got into the sea, we're allowed to get in, um, and we put the three strongest swimmers in first. So Ed went first, then Luke, then Tom, and they had really struggled. We were, we were massively behind schedule because, um, because of the weather. Um, and, and then after three hours, the, 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 the sea just went flat, went pan flat. Um, and I'd been speaking to the pilot boat and I said, you know, where are we in terms of, in terms of uh, distance? And he gave me the figure where we were and we were miles beyond where we should have been. Unbeknownst to me at the time, he'd given me the figure in nautical miles, which is 1.15 miles. So he's telling me in nautical miles. I'm thinking he's on land miles and I've got the wrong figure. So I'm even further behind where we thought we should have been anyway. Um, that's me because I'm a, a Midlands lad who doesn't really go to the sea very often. So... Um, we were behind schedule and then Rob jumps in, in a, in a mill pond and smashes out an hour swim. And Rob had been on the boat for three hours, suffering from seasickness. He'd been throwing up over the side of the boat for three hours. His, run, his swim slot was coming up. We didn't even know he was going to be able to get in the water or not. Um, I, just, I went to give him a pep talk and say, you know, you're okay, Rob. That's what he threw up over the side of the, of the boat, um, wiped his chin, pulled his wetsuit line and jumped in the water. And he smashed out his hour. Um, I jumped in after Rob. Again, flat mill pond. Stu jumped in, flat mill pond. And then the three boys jumped back in, who were even quicker than we were. And we were back on track. Um, and again, we, we did the swim. Um, we did the swim in just over, just under 11 hours. Uh, so we were back on target for the record. We were back on target for the record. We were actually ahead of schedule again. Um, we'd been awake, you know, at this point, about 30 hours, 35 hours. Um, and we had an 187 mile bike ride to go to Paris, but we don't, we were on track. We'd, we'd gone through the, we'd gone through the kind of rough bits. We'd had some setbacks. Uh, there's more setbacks there on the run as well, which I haven't gone into, but there were things that we were doing, but because we took the thinking out of it at the beginning and because we were just making sure we just got there as quick as we can and everyone knew their role, um, in the, on the minibus, we had rotations. So, you basically, you were, you were either the athlete on the road, you were in recovery, you had two hours recovery, so you had three seats to yourself, so that, that there were three hours. Then you were in admin role, so basically you were doing everything, every decision that needed to make, you had your seat, you were making decisions for the athlete on the road, you making sure you had nutrition, uh, making sure everything was correct, you had gear setups, different spare wheels, you were the admin guy, you were looking after that. And then hour five, you were you were basically prepping for your next, for your next role. So you had every single thing taken care of. And that's where it counted, especially when we got on the bike, everyone was tired because we were getting challenges coming towards us. It was getting fractious. It was getting, you know, the banter had changed to kind of, it was getting a little bit more difficult because people were tired, but we'd taken that element away. we have taken that element away of anybody to make any confusion, just crack on, do your role. Yeah. Um, and that's where it counted. Um, the bike, bike went, went went well again you know we we we, we, we cracked on with the bike um and everyone did their role we were tired but we knew our numbers um we cycled through the night we cycled through the night because we obviously arrived in, we did the swim through the day and then we arrived in calais in the early evening so we were cycling in the dark um and as we got as we we're on the bike uh, we we're all doing our roles all doing our, our slots um me and rob the strongest cyclists in the group so we've been given two really good 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 slots um, I'd actually invested it, um, in a in an off-road mountain bike light, which is quite a strong light, so I could see the road. Imagine cycling through rural villages in France um, on this bike. And the minibus had been leapfrogging us every, all, all the way along, on the run and on the swim, on the, on the bike, sorry, um, to get in front of us on the road. And as we were getting tired of the cheers from the minibus, we were becoming a bit less enthusiastic, you know, as we carried on. And I remember we were cycling through a French village and I'd, I'd come, I'm coming down this hill with this big mountain bike light on, the minibus is up ahead. And I can see them up ahead 
Um, and usually kind of when you come in up, they kind of, someone was there, at least someone say, you okay, do you need any, any drink or anything? And nobody, nobody noticed me at all. They didn't kind of say anything to me. Um, and I thought, that's strange. Maybe there's something going wrong. Maybe they're looking at a map or whatever it is and carried on. Anyway, it turns out because I had the, the big light on and they didn't kind of see me coming down the road. And because I was coming down a hill, they confused me for a motorbike. So I was quite proud of that moment because uh, obviously I was, I was going at a decent speed uh, to, to get past them. So, uh, yeah, that was that was quite an interesting point. Um, we then going to Paris. Um, you know, it, it, the the route into Paris, up the Champs Elysees. If any of you are into cycling, the Champs Elysees is a mecca for cyclists. It's the end of the Tour de France and all that kind of thing. And Luke, Luke took the baton there. And Luke finished things off, um, and we got into we got into um, got into Paris, and everything everything worked well. And the teamwork had come together. Um, and when we landed in Paris, um, we stopped the clock in 35 hours and 53 minutes and took a took the record um which kind of pulled it all together uh and that's the team there so that's the team on the on the champs today like early morning on saturday so we've got big rob on the right then luke me in the middle ed tom uh ed Stu, and tom and then on the end is andy mountsey who works for a company called enduraman who ratified the challenge for the timings and everything else um and it's yeah, and that, and that was that was kind of journey. I could talk about it for a long, long time. It's uh, something that's I pulled a lot of lessons from it, and those habits that you get from things like that, you pull into your personal life, and you pull into things that you do to kind of one habit forces another habit. In my opinion, and we never we we we're never at best we're never better than when we've been challenged. We, we force ourselves to find new solutions and find ourselves to do different things. Um, I think when we're at challenge, we, we're at our most successful. Um, that's kind of me. Um, yeah. What I hope you've got is is a is, is a takeaway. If you can pull one thing from it, then then great. And you know, I open up to, to questions in a minute. Um, but in summary, the things that we did was the right environment, having the right environment, having the right people in that environment to contribute to it, having the right people around you. We had a big support crew around us as well. Um, but not only the right people around you, but the right people in the right places. And making sure you've checked and monitored that and making sure everyone's comfortable with it and then planning the route from b to a um and one of my kind of favorite sayings is you stretch your comfort zone it's like a muscle it never goes back the same size once you've achieved something you can pass that message on and you can do you can do great things um that's fantastic that's fantastic dave absolutely brilliant um let's have a round of applause for for, for david yeah really really inspirational I, I you know one of the obvious questions is why <laughs> but, but, but uh but but absolutely that was absolutely. my question kev why yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but. The, the main the main reason why at the time was we wanted because we wanted to do something for charity it was doing something out of the ordinary it was doing something that the other people aren't and when it stands out on a, on a page he's got and that for that reaction there i guess and when we when we were doing it we didn't actually realize what what you know how big it might may sound to somebody else but it was when you say that and when everyone when you say swim the english channel people kind of they step back a little bit and take notice that was that was the main reason why mm. no absolutely absolutely amazing and as louise put in the chat you know um so many nuggets and and, and, and takeaways out of, out of that that apply as you say to personal lives, but definitely to business life as, as as well. So let's let's open the floor up to to questions. I, th I think we'll what we will sacrifice the breakout um, room that we that we were planning on doing breakout session and just just stick with some questions because I think there's going to be loads. So who'd like to kick off with a question? Andy, yes, go ahead. Dave, well done. Good, good. Congratulations, first of all. <laughs> Thanks, um, man. If, if I don't know if it has been beaten, but if the record got beaten again, would you would you do it all over again? No, no, I wouldn't. No, <laughs> no, no, not at all, Andy. I mean, I've got three children now, um, and yeah, it, it was so much time. It was so time consuming. We were training probably eighteen hours a week in the gym. You know, like 17, 17 to twenty hours a week in the gym. Um, you know, going off going off for four or five hour bike rides and then going for a run off the back of that. It doesn't really uh, doesn't really accommodate family life. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Somebody else must have a question, surely. Yeah, Dave, Dave there you go. Uh, I have a massive event to go through with all these people. Do you still keep in touch with them all? 
Yeah, we, yeah, we do. Yeah, um, not as not as much as we should, but everyone's got families. You know, everyone's got their own family life now, and, and time gets in the way. I can say, but um, we do keep in touch, and it's um, yeah, it's it's one of those things that pulls you together, isn't it? It's uh, it was a great event to be a part of. Um, and again, I think all the things just fell in, fell into one place at one at one point. Finding people that kind of me and Stu the network around. So I knew Rob and Stu knew the other, the other three swimmer guys. So it was kind of pulling that team together. Um, but yeah, we, we do Did keep you lose any weight, Dave? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, I was always I was already a skinny thing at the time. So when I because I was racing for Ironman anyway, um, I was you know I was always a, I was already a skinny thing. Hence my uh, my lack of body fat to keep me warm in the water. <laughs> Jenny, yes. Yeah. Was was there ever a point that you or anyone else in the team went, "Oh, this just isn't this just isn't worth it"? We're just, you know, I just want to give up, or you know, we. And also, was that the fact that you were going for that record? You know, if if you'd have just done it, but not had that record-breaking thing in mind, do you think you would have changed anything or done it differently? And enjoyed uh, it maybe a bit more. Yeah. <laughs> Remind me of the second question in a minute. Just going back to the first, the first one. Um, no, nobody, any, no, at no point did anybody say, I've had it, I, I don't want to do this in, in the training or in the event. Um, that may have changed if we were behind schedule, um, but there was only one point there in the swim where we thought, and we, we didn't have any choice since we had to crack on anyway. Um, but no, at no point did anybody ever say, I've had enough, I'm not doing this, it's not worth it. Um, and what was the second question, Jen? The fact that you had that target in mind to, to break that record, yeah. did that make a difference on how you approach things as opposed to just do it? Because one of my clients has done it from Kent. One of my one of my accountancy clients, he did it. But the, he just, he just you know, there was no pressure for them. They just did it as a little group and they just took their time over it. And, you know, it was a massive achievement for him. But, yeah. you know, you guys went out with this, this purpose yeah. of getting that record. Did that change how you approached it? And if you didn't have that as the approach, you were just doing it for charity, but you hadn't set that goal of breaking the record. Do you think that would have changed a little bit about how you structured it and what you were going for? Um, I, I don't think we could have structured it any other way. We literally, you know, we put so much contingency planning in place. We did have a couple of mishaps on the bike, which we could have actually gone about an hour quicker. Um, but because of mishaps on the bike, we, we, we lost about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Um, but if we didn't get a record, yeah, it wouldn't have been a nice show. The, the cherry wouldn't have been as nice on the top, and we probably wouldn't have drank as much champagne in in, uh, in Paris. Um, but it still would have been an achievement. Um, but I would have been, I would have been, I'm a competitive soul. I would have been very upset if we didn't get the record. Uh, and I think that's the kind of determination and drive to actually get the record because it was. If swim people were getting tired on a bike, it's just you know. It was just sort itself out and crack on. Mm. Graham, yes. How did they? How did they? Yeah, uh, David has a great story. I really enjoyed listening to that. One thing, it's almost a similar question to what Jenny was asking. I mean, you were planning this for 18 months and you had 18 months of planning, training. And then you mentioned in the story that the record was smashed by a military team a few weeks before. And I just wondered. Did you have to change your training process or thought process to because of that target changing so close to your, you know, your start date? Um, no, we didn't. We, didn't, we couldn't. We couldn't change anything. It was, it was too. We were too close in. It was too close, ready to go. And um, I think what it did, it's like, it's like you can't have a superhero without a villain, can you? It's. It was. It was that thing. I think it gave us a bit of an edge because the sixty-seven hours was kind of like we're probably going to smash that really. Because they kind of came in and, and actually chopped off the bit that we thought we were going to chop off, we had to go a bit more and it maybe give us a bit of an edge and maybe it kind of just drove us a bit more. But we couldn't change the training plan because we'd, we'd, we'd been 18 months in a, in a, in a planning. So yeah. it was what it was. What? Thank you, David. Thank you. Yeah, right, Doug, you. Yeah. Doug. How, do you, how do you go about um, this think dreaming up the idea of doing this i mean is it something that you were just sitting there thinking oh now i'm going to ring the boys we're going to do this or is it uh you know you all got a bit drunk fancy a crack, fancy a crack. To do it. fancy a go <laughs> hey 
I've, I've, done, I've, done a, I've done a I've done a few mad things. Like I've done marathons and little bits pieces like that that I've got talked into. But uh, I think that might be a step too far at my age. But. but well, it was to be honest. Where it came from was I was I was I was racing at the time Ironman, and I was I used to read a, read a, a magazine called uh, Triathlon 220, um, and it, it was in there. The event was in there, um, when it was me and Stu were just kind of having a coffee after the gym. Like, have a look at this, and before we know it, six of us were in a coffee shop arranging how we were going to do it. Um, it just it's one of those things, man. I think, and I think if it hadn't happened that quickly. Where everyone going, yeah, we'll have a go at that. Yeah, we'll have a go. And all of a sudden, we, we, we started doing it. And you put you put your nail, you know, you put you put your, your towel on the sunbed. It's uh, that's it. Whenever I've done stuff and I've got talked into it, and and I think you've got a group of you that are there, and yeah, it makes it so much harder to yeah. to step out because if you're just on your own, you think, yeah, do you know what? I can't be bothered. I've got to train in the rain. I'm not going to do it. Exactly, exactly that, Doug. And it was peer pressure. And once you put your, you know, you put your name down, and we, it was, I think, because it happened that quickly, we, and then we just cracked on and we started the ball, the, the wheel in motion. Um, yeah. Very good. What What was um, What was your target time, Dave? What What did you think you would achieve? Uh, it yeah, original planning was kind of around between forty, between forty and forty three hours, based on you know the biggest kind of the unknown was the transition time. So if we landed in Dover too soon, we'd have to wait longer for the pilot boat. We ended up losing an hour waiting for the pilot boat um, because we got there a bit early. We, we did the run quicker than we should have done, um, but we still got a, a good good quim. And then we got a bit more break, a bit more break. So, um, and then also when we get into, into Calais, making sure that the, the support crew, they'd gone, they'd gone to uh, stop in a hotel overnight and then jump on the ferry the first morning to meet us there. So it was kind of making sure that all those things worked, um, yeah. and they t they they fed into the plan, you know, in terms of how we were doing stuff. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yes, Graham. Sorry, just just one more question, David. Is the the the, the one it, part of the whole challenge that you had no control over? Obviously, is the swimming because you can't control the weather and the tide and the the, the sea yeah. conditions. What was your contingency for? delay in the swim would you have aborted and then started again or would you have carried on regardless knowing that you're not going to yeah. win the the, the 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 record so we 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 already delayed it three days we were due to go on the tuesday um and because the sea was that bad we had to delay on the tuesday anyway so we couldn't go um we regrouped um put everything back changed hotel accommodation changed all these other things that we kind of had to put in place uh changed the pilot boat all these kind of things that we, we were actually putting in place to change. So we changed it once. Um, and on the Friday, it was still 50-50, whether we could go or not. But we, we didn't have a choice. Everyone else had booked time off work and family commitments, all these kind of things. So literally on the Friday, we didn't have a choice whether we could delay it anymore because of our external, external commitments. So on the Friday, it was a case of we've got to start at Marble Arch, five o'clock to get to, 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 get to, to, uh, to Dover, um, ready for the swim in the early hours of Saturday morning. So uh, yeah, it was, and if, 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 if we couldn't have swam, the only thing we could have done just to carry on the challenge to make the money for charity, we'd agreed that we were going to do a coastal swim. So we would have swam along, swam along the coast uh, for 12 and a half miles and swam back. And if that was even too, too, too busy and we couldn't do that, we'd organise so we could do it. We could do laps of the harbour. So we would have to do laps of the harbour to get the swim done and then get the ferry across. But we would have avoided the challenge and we would have avoided the record as well. Mm. Yeah. Brilliant. Any any final question from anyone? Fantastic. Really, really good. Does the record still stand? Do you still hold it or has someone beaten it since? No, it's gone. It went, it went a couple of years ago. Yeah. What, what sort of time is it now? It took off about 48 minutes, I think, 48 minutes quicker. Yeah, really, really impressive. Really, really impressive. No, but, but fantastic, David. Thank you very much.